this week's Technique Tuesday video, I'll demonstrate a sock toe commonly used in contemporary sock patterns, and then I'll show you how to modify that toe for a better fit. As always, if you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, there are direct links down in the description. Here I have a little child's sock. It was knit with a short row heel, but the toe was knit with a pretty typical sock toe. It's called the wedge toe. You can see that there are decreases at the edges of the instep and the sole. The decreases are, de are separated by two columns of knit stitches. And typically the formula for knitting a wedge toe is to knit four decreases per decrease round. So you do a decrease at each edge of the instep and each edge of the sole, and then you'd work a plain round, then you'd work another decrease round, and you'd follow every decrease round with a plain round until you had about a third of the stitches remaining. And the last round that you would work would be a decrease round. You wouldn't work another a plain round after that. What that does is it gives you a toe length that is very close to 25% of whatever the sock circumference was. So if your sock is eight inches in circumference, then you'd end up with a toe that was two inches in length. The problem is that just because you need a sock that's eight inches in circumference, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need a toe that's two inches in length because people have feet that are differently shaped. And so today I'm gonna to show you how to work the wedge toe and then what to do in order to modify it to get a better fit. So right here, I have a sock toe swatch in progress where I've begun working the decreases. So I'm gonna show you how that works. You'll notice that I'm using magic loop. I'm using a method of working small circumferences in the round with a very long circular needle. But you may not be using magic loop. You may be using the two circulars method or you may be using double pointed needles. The important thing is to divide the stitches in two halves so that one half has the instep stitches and one half has the sole stitches. If you're using double pointed needles, depending on the number of double points you're using, you might have all of the instep stitches on one single double point and the sole st stitches on two double points. Or if you like to use uh, four double points with a fifth one as the working needle, you might have the instep divided into two a double points and the sole into two double points. It doesn't really matter. The point is to know where the beginning of the round is and the middle of the round is. And those two points are going to be dividing the instep from the sole. When you start your decreases, you're going to be starting either at the beginning of, an in, of the instep or at the beginning of the sole. It doesn't really matter. For a decrease round, you knit the very first stitch of the instep or the sole, and then you work a left-leaning decrease. So to work a left-leaning decrease, such as the SSK, you slip two stitches, one at a time as if to knit. You insert the left needle through those two stitches. You work them together. And then you're going to knit across the rest of those instep stitches or the rest of those sole stitches until you have just three stitches remaining. So I have three stitches remaining. Now it's time for another decrease. This time I'm going to do a right leaning decrease, which is a knit two together. I know it's right leaning when I insert my needle because my needle is pointing to the right. I work those two stitches together and then I work the final knit stitch. Then I work the other half of the round the same way. Again, it's knit the first stitch, then do a left leaning decrease. I slip two stitches one at a time as if to knit. I insert my left needle and you can see my working needle is pointing to the left. That's how I know this is going to be a left leaning decrease. And again, I work across until I have three stitches remaining. And once again, I work a knit two together and then I work the final decrease. 
So after you work a decrease round, then you are supposed to work just a plain round with no decreases. What happens if you get interrupted or if you forget, did I just work a decrease round or did I just work a plain round? How do I know if I'm supposed to decrease? Look at the stitches under the needle. If you just worked a decrease round, the stitches that are directly under the needle will, will be lying on top of each other. In that second stitch position under the needle, you'll see there's a, this stitch is actually on top of the other stitch. That way you'll know, okay, I already did a decrease round, now it's time for a plain round. Okay, now I've just finished my plain round, but how can I tell that I've just finished a plain round? How can I tell that apart from a decrease round? Well, this time when you look under the needle, you'll just see there's a plain stitch here, where below that plain stitch is where you can see the decrease, where the stitch is lying on top of the stitch under it. So now you know that it's time for a decrease. So you may wonder, well, how is a toe like this supposed to look right on a human foot? Because our toes are not, our feet aren't shaped like this. This is a sock that was knit with a wedge toe. And you can see that even though my foot is not really shaped like a wedge, it's kind of more slightly angled here and much more angled in this direction that this line of decreases that's separated by the two stitches, that forms kind of the, the thickness of my foot and it allows those, decrease, those decreases to uh, run along the edge of my toe. On this side of my foot, the decreases ride on top of my toes and those final stitches, those third of the stitches that were remaining, I grafted them together and that span of stitches rides along the top of my big toe and then extends a little ways past it. If I touch it, I can tell that it's about in the middle of my second toe. So the graft plus the decrease line on one side of the wedge runs along the top of the toes while the other decrease line runs along the edge of the big toe. So the goal when you are knitting the toes is to start doing the decreases at the point where your feet start to narrow and that can vary from person to person. We're often given landmarks about where to start the toe decreases. Sometimes we're told to start two inches before uh, the full length of the sock foot that we want or we're told to, to start the toe decreases when we've reached the base of the big toe. Um, but that really can vary from person to person whether that those are appropriate places to begin working their sock toes. So these are outlines of people who I would be knitting for who aren't going to be near me when I'm trying on my sock. So let me show you, I'm gonna show you my bare foot just as a warning. Let me show you where I start my sock toe decreases. I knit my sock foot until when I put the sock on, the needle holding the stitches it goes straight across and it's right at that base where my large toe uh, separates from my second toe. And on me, you can see that that is pretty much the same as where the ball of my foot starts making an indent. So this is where my foot starts to get narrower. And over on this side, I have quite a bit of a, a dent right here at the base of my little toe. This, these are all in line with each other. Some people will start working their sock toes when the sock has reached the tip of their small toe but for me that would be way up here so because of the way my feet are shaped that's not a good landmark for me for me the a good landmark is where the ball of my foot has ended and where my toes separate and from there then i would take a ruler and i'd measure well how long do i need my sock toe to be and then i can figure out well how many rounds would that be with my friends Helen and Rosemary though, I don't have them with me in order to try the sock on. So I can't tell where exactly their toe separates. I did put a pen or a pencil between their toes and marked that location. This location tends to be a little bit higher up than where the toe actually separates because of the webbing that you have between your toes. It's going to, it's going to put that pen a little bit up higher. 
But the thing that you can see that's very different about Helen and Rosemary's feet compared to my feet is that Helen's little toe ends before her big toe and second toe separate. So her foot is getting narrower at the top of her little toe um, well before the point where these two toes separate. So for her, I'm going to want to knit a sock toe that begins here because that's when her toes, her feet start to, to really narrow. So for her, I want something that's two and a half inches long. But Rosemary, the, you can see barely the ball of her foot, how it's coming in right here. And that's about where the base of her big toe is. Again, if you presume it's a little bit lower than that. And it's also about the place where her little toe meets. So for her, those three landmarks are really all the same place. And I can measure that. And for her, she needs about an inch and three quarters. So these two people wear the same size shoe. They have very differently shaped feet and they need sock toes that are different lengths. So before you knit your sock toe and you want to know, well, how many rounds long do I need my sock toe to be? You have knit the entire foot up to that point. So you can take a ruler and you can measure how many rounds long that sock toe needs to be for the particular person. So uh, you could use your row gauge and calculate it out. You're going to get a more exact measurement if you just measure the actual length that you're going to need on the knitting that you actually have. I'm starting with, for my friend Rosemary, she has a foot that's a little bigger around than my friend Helen, so she needs a sock that's a little bit bigger around. She has a sock that's 64 stitches in circumference. And when we do the decreases, we need to get down to about a third of the number of stitches that we started with. And you can't do that uh, exactly if you have 64 stitches. You can only do that approximately. So we're gonna go down to 20 stitches. Um, because we started with a multiple of four, we're getting rid of four stitches each time, so this has to be a multiple of four too. So the total number of stitches we're decreasing is 44, and because we're decreasing four stitches every time we do a decrease round, that means that there are 11 decrease rounds all together. Now, she needed a toe length that was 1.75 inches long and if you measure that it sh there was a row gauge of 10 stitch or 10 rows per inch that would give you a total number of rounds that she needs for her toe of 17. So I have 11 decrease rounds but I need 17 rounds all together. So one of the things I like to do is is create a little chart for myself so I can really see uh, how and when I need to decrease. So I start with 64 stitches. When I do the first decrease round, then I'm down to 60. And if I have a plain round after that, or any plain rounds after that, those rounds are also going to have 60. It's only when you have a decrease round, the stitch count goes down. So I have 11 decrease rounds. There's never another plain round after the decrease round. And I need 17 rounds altogether. So I need to add six plain rounds. And you're always going to add rounds in the early part and eliminate them um, toward the end if you don't have a plain round after every decrease round. So I have 11 rounds for sure. So I know I need a round here that's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So if I work a plain round, for the, after the first six decrease rounds, I'll be down to 40 stitches. And then once I work the next decrease round that brings me down to 36, I don't need any plain rounds here at all. My friend Helen has a, a foot that's a little smaller in circumference, so she only needs a sock with 60 stitches. Um, and that one actually does decrease down uh, evenly to a third of the original number. So she's also going to come down to 20 stitches. Um, but the number of stitches decreased in total is only 40. And again, because every decrease round eliminates four stitches, that means that she has 10 decrease rounds. But remember, she needed a longer toe. I need to knit a toe for her that's two and a half inches long. And so if you measure the sock 
um, with the gauge of that has 10 rounds um, per inch, she's going to need a total of 25 rounds for her sock toe. So again, I have this little chart that I work and she starts out with 60 and then she goes to 56 and all the way down. And again, I don't do any playing rounds after the last decrease round. So the decrease rounds are, there's only 10 of them and I need 25 rounds altogether. That means I'm going to need some rounds are going to need more than one playing round, but let's just start counting. So we've got 10 here, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So for Helen, I am going to be working the first six decrease rounds followed by two plain rounds. So when I go to 32 stitches, when I decrease my seventh time and I have 32 stitches, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one plain round after every one of those decrease rounds going forward. The final step of the wedge toe is to graft the remaining stitches together. If you don't like the Kitchener stitch method of grafting, there are other methods that you may find more agreeable. The Finchley graft, which is done from the purl side of the work, is much easier to remember and to execute. Or you might like the toe chimney method, which doesn't require working with live stitches at all. I have a playlist of grafting methods you can explore up here. And for more of my videos on sock techniques, I have a playlist you can check out down here. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.